makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lockwood. A very good morning and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Manus Cranny in Dubai and for Francine Lacroix today on the stories that set the agenda on the program. The global rally extends amid optimism that U.S. inflation is moderating. But PIMCO warns about the disconnect between valuations and a worsening economic backdrop. Authority tested. President Emmanuel Macron pushes to restore order across France after almost a week of riots sparked by a police officer's fatal shooting of a teenager as the cost mounts. Plus, putting the foot down. Tesla and China's BYD set quarterly sales records on surging demand for electric vehicles. Very good morning. Francine is out for the day. You have the pleasure of my company for the next hour. Quick check on markets. We've just had a red headline on the manufacturing for Europe. We are firmly in contraction, 43.4. The preliminary estimate was for 43.2. So you are just seeing uh, across the assets here, uh, equities, Nasdaq put on 2% last week. The question you must ask yourself as you start the second half of the year, you have traded equities pretty much with immunity. Will you be able to continue to do so with impunity going into the second half of the year? Oil steadies, I mean, it's been a record losing streak for four quarters. The hedge funds are the most bearish on WTI since November 2017. A battle royal is being drawn between the specs in the market and the meeting of the oil ministers in Vienna, which I will leave for after this show. Rates, you're seeing yields rise 3.84%. There was a massive dislocation last Thursday on the better data. Rate cuts are gone. How many more rate hikes will come? The dollar is up. However, the hedge funds are bailing on the positions. Dollar longs fall to the lowest since March. You are just seeing a structural repositioning in the dollar. To the map across Europe, as I say, firmly in a manufacturing retrenchment. There are riots in France. This is a state of play on European equities. Let's have a quick look at that for you. You have got small gains across the board in terms of the equity markets. We'll bring that to you in just a second. As I say, you had a breaking you had a breaking red headline there uh, on the manufacturing side of the European complex. Let's just have a look at the European equity map. Here we go. Actually, the other dynamic is this. This is what you really need to focus on, which is, which is the twos, tens, uh, the inversion. It's deep, it's malevolent. And is it prescient? That is the question. You're looking at one of the deepest uh, and darkest moments in the bond inversion in decades, in over 30 years. Is this disconnect between the equity market and the bond market something which will come to pass more aggressively as we go into the second half of the year. That's the state of play on the markets. Let's move the agenda uh, along and begin with our main story this morning on France, which is, of course, uh, the protests in France have continued for a fifth night uh, as the police killing of a teenager gripped the country. Some 45,000 police were deployed in an effort to contain clashes that left hundreds of public buildings and shops damaged and ransacked. Our correspondent for France, Caroline Conant, joins me now from Paris. Caroline, talk me through the fifth night of protests and the estimated cost to the economy at this stage. Caroline. The peak of the riots actually may have passed because we only saw about 150 arrests uh, last night uh, compared to more than 700, for example, on Saturday and 1,300 on Friday night. But still, of course, uh, dozens of uh, banks, uh, supermarkets, 700 supermarkets, according to the French finance minister, schools, public buildings uh, have been damaged. Uh, there's been some looting. Uh, some buildings have been vandalized over the past few few days. So, of course, this will cost a lot to the French economy. The first estimate uh, is at least 100 million euros in damages. But this is, of course, if the riots stop today. So it is unclear whether the riots will continue over the next few nights. Uh, as you said, about 45,000 police officers are deployed every night across the country. And the rioters are usually very young, between 14 and 18 years old. Uh, and they come from those poor suburbs, what we call uh, cities uh, 
uh, in France from low-income neighborhoods where uh, the population is uh, undereducated, underemployed, and very often from uh, immigrant uh, descent. So, of course, uh, this uh, means the government will also have to address the deep issues in those neighborhoods uh, and the discrimination that the police uh, may have faced in, in the case of the killing of this teenager uh, last uh, Tuesday. Uh, and clearly, as you can see on all the French newspapers today, France is uh, still uh, shocked. Uh, we'll see how the situation uh, evolves tonight and over the next few nights. Yeah, Caroline, and certainly uh, Emmanuel Macron blaming social media uh, for a great deal. Uh, of what has happened and escalated over the past couple of nights. We'll return to this story a little bit later on with you, Caroline Conan in Paris. I'm joined now by John Bilton, head of global multi-asset strategy at JP Morgan Asset Management. John, many asset managers often join myself and Francine and they say we never trade geopolitics. Um, so I'm not <laughs> asking you to, to trade geopolitics. Um, how serious a moment is this for France, for Europe? Uh, and just in terms of risks, as you look at it this morning. Well, look, I think you're absolutely right to home in on geopolitics being something which doesn't necessarily drive economics. I mean, we've seen this time after time. I mean, obviously, it's shocking scenes in France. We certainly hope that uh, semblance of calm comes back in. But I think at the moment, the reality is we should be focusing on what the consumer is doing, what company earnings are telling us. Of course, we've got earnings season coming up very soon and where the ECB are going after Sintra last week. So I think that's really going to be what drives, um, what drives the economic outlook from here on in. Briefly, where does the ECB go post Sintra? Well, it's super interesting looking at the PMIs, really, isn't it? We've got um, a hike nailed on pretty much for July. We think we probably see 4% as the ECB's terminal rate. But, you know, the PMI is showing this sort of, you know, slowing in manufacturing. Despite the fact we've got a very strong consumer in Europe, probably tells us that the ECB are very close towards the end of what has been a fairly hawkish run for them. The consequence of that is, uh, of course, we've had this, as I said, we've been able to gorge on equities with immunity, but can we trade, can we gorge the second half with impunity? That's what I want to know from a risk perspective for the equity market, first of all, John. Well, I, I love the way you said gorge on equities. It put me immediately in mind of that old Warren Buffett phrase, which is be greedy when everyone's fearful. Um, so, you know, but let's look at the facts. If you go back over 50 odd years, in fact, if you go back to 1950 and you look at years when you've had a positive first half in the S&P 500, um, you know, 78% mm -hmm. of the time you get a positive second half. You know, momentum in economies tends to build slowly and stably through time. Um, I think we've got to be very careful not to continue to look for this recession, which is apparently still six months around the corner, some 18 months after it was mm -hmm. first called. So I think we've got to look at the facts. We've got to look at the earnings data. We've got to look at valuations. We've got to look at company statements. And the reality is, I think, that equity markets still are extending something of a wall of worry. Now, it's been a very, very strong uh, couple of weeks, technically. So I've certainly got sympathy for those who want to sit on their hands and look for a slightly better entry point. But for, to be honest with you, I'd say don't be too greedy because those um, you know, corrections downwards could be short-lived. I mean, I should, I should perhaps uh, temper my enthusiasm. <clears throat> I've had three weeks away traveling <laughs> different countries. So when I talk about gorging, I suppose really what I am talking about is this you know, voracious appetite for Japan, which has been mm. evident. I mean, 30-year high on the topics, etc. When you look at the five trillion added to the NASDAQ, the Japan market trading the highest since 1990s and the mega caps putting on 74%. Are they just not bothered about the deepest inversion in 30 years in the curve? I think there's a bit more to it than that. I mean, look, I think front and centre, anybody who is on a more constructive end of this, and I include myself within that, you know, looks at the yield curve with some level of concern. But there are two things, to, well, three things, actually, that I would flag. Number one, uh, we have to account for inflation, which, of course, has been pushing up front-end rates and is now gradually coming down. So let's wait and see where that goes. Secondly, we all know that the yield curve is the best... Um, unbiased indicator of forward rate expectations. If everyone expects a recession in the forward, not surprising that you get an inverted curve. And number three, what I would say is that this looks like a late cycle environment in many economic indicators, not least the curve, but the imbalances, the excess borrowing, which is often coincident with those indicators, is notable by its absence this time around. 
OK, uh, John, you're going to stay with us. We've got a few more uh, topics to get through. Uh, stay there, seated and ready to go in London. Coming up, the UBS boss, Sergio Motti, is said to be wary of floating Credit Suisse's domestic unit. The Universal Bank, for sale or not, on Bahnhofstrasse. We have the details on Bloomberg. <laughs> The conversations that matter and the insights that you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Menace Cranny in Dubai. So UBS is planning to clarify next month that its Credit Suisse rescue will rely on funding from the Swiss taxpayers. Meanwhile, a Swiss newspaper has reported that UBS isn't planning an IPO for the domestic unit of Credit Suisse. Two very contentious issues that have plagued their story. Marion uh, Halfemer is joining me now from Zurich. Marion, good to see you today. So talk me through the options. I mean, the Swiss unit within Credit Suisse is the jewel, as it were. It really was the jewel in this deal. What are the real options for that business? So UBS's CEO, Sergio Motti, has said that the base case is they want to keep this Swiss Universal Bank, the Swiss domestic entity of Credit Suisse. However, after the deal was announced earlier this year, there was some scrutiny um, from politicians and locally around what that would mean for jobs and for the market share components of the two banks. Um, so they've been analyzing that, and they have said that they plan to announce that in the third quarter. So we expect some information at the end of August when they report their second quarter results. Um, so realistically, our options here are they could keep it and integrate it with their own domestic bank. And then there were the options of potentially floating it in an IPO or spin it off in some way um, in keeping a shareholding. It looks like, and from what we're hearing from our, our contacts as well, is that they're really keen to keep it. And as you said, it's a base scenario. And then, of course, we have this other report referring to Thomas Gottstein. He stepped down. You recall that that weekend I ended up having the, the chairman walk in rather than Gottstein. Um, now, this is a report uh, that FINMA are investigating Gottstein. What do we know? What does the report say? So this dates back to an investigation that FINMA, the Swiss banking regulator here, opened up against four individuals in February related to the Greensill collapse. So you'll remember Credit Suisse had this big collapse with $10 billion worth of funds uh, related to supply chain finance. Um, they are still investigating individuals' roles in this. And so allegedly, according to these reports, Thomas Gottschien, the former CEO of Credit Suisse, is, also, is one of those four individuals. OK, we'll certainly track the story and uh, keep an eye on those results at the end of August for UBS in terms of just how much help they need from the government. Marion, thank you very much, Marion. Uh, Halfmeyer there in Zurich. John Bilton is our guest this morning, head of global multi-asset strategy at JP Morgan Asset Management, still with us. So we won't ask you about buying JP Morgan stock because that would just be precarious. But John, on a broader perspective, here we are, the UBS transformation of Credit Suisse as a joined up entity has huge ramifications for the dividend and the buyback, the two great unknowns on UBS. A look at American banks upping the dividend payout on Friday, your own house being one of them. How important is the dividend story to distinguishing being long America or long Europe Swiss? Well, I mean, I think this is an interesting point. I think we've got to take a step back from any individual company, of course, and we've got to look at where, where, where this has led us. Think back to March, and we saw real concern around the US regional banking sector, and of course, some fairly dark mutterings about the idea that we were going to see Lehman. 2.0 and that all of a sudden the whole um, system would come under pressure. And the reality is, I think what we've seen subsequently is, number one, the Fed acted extremely quickly to put in a backstop. Number two, uh, we can see from the larger scale um, banking sector within the US that this is a very specific business model issue with the regionals. But then, crucially, Europe. I think, you know, for you know, a decade and more since the sovereign crisis, it's been possible to, any, to, to think any time there's an issue in the banking sector, even if it's just the whiff of an issue, made sense to be underweight the Euro European banks. And I think that the business models and the st stability of the dividend and the buybacks that are going on suggest that those days are behind us. On 0 0.6, 0 0.7 times price to tangible book, the sector actually is now mm -hmm. one of the 
stabilising parts of the European index as opposed to one of the dangers for the European index. And there you go. And, 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 and banks at one stage... Um, a couple of fund managers have come on here and they've sort of said, look, we wouldn't touch them with a barge pole. Um, you talk about convexity. I'm interested to, to understand how I prepare for convexity in the second half of the year because you're generally pro-risk. Um, so how do I prepare or what is your perspective on convexity in the second half? Well, I think the way to look at it is, is if one is running a balanced portfolio, as we're privileged to do across our books of business, what we're looking for is to really understand how we can have decent returns in any state of the world. You know, this is an uncertain environment. And while, as you probably understand, I sit on the more constructive end, you know, it's not lost on me that there remain some pretty profound risks. And so to that end, we want to be overweight duration. Now, of course, that's really giving us good exposure in a weaker economic environment. And we'd be clipping the coupon if we run down the middle from here. What it doesn't do for us is give us much protection if actually some of this more constructive narrative really hits, we get a pause in the central bank's uh, hiking cycle, and the economy actually does deliver this soft landing that's been spoken of. Under those circumstances, not having some exposure to the top side means that you're exposed. So for us, it's having balance and robustness in all of those possible states of the world and just making sure that we've got something which allows us to be able to deliver gradual, steady, long-term gains. And for that reason, we need to think about where we can add risk into a portfolio, particularly if it's one which has duration overweights. And, and I know that you have upgraded both your equity, and I'm interested to see that you've moved to neutral on your credit position. But this takes us to a viewer question, which has come in. So let me just put this to you. Mm. You've already, in part, answered this. Um, you've said, look, it's going to be not a hard, not necessarily a hard landing, hence the reason why you have that little bit more proclivity for equity and, and credit risk. The question is this. Uh, are we ready for a shallower yet longer recession? Well, you've already answered that, yes. But what do you think the repercussions are for refinancing in 2024, 2025? A lot of that refinancing pain has yet to be affected on the bottom line. Where will the refinancing mm. pain be most pronounced, I suppose, is what goes through my mind for, for this question from a viewer? What would you say to that? Well, I think we're already seeing where the pain is hitting. We've seen it in the regional banks. We've seen it in the real estate sector. And these are areas where we have seen some stress coming through. Also, we've seen those borrowers who have perhaps been more marginal um, coming into the loans market with floating rates already begin to have those pressure on their balance sheets. It's worth noting that the high yield market today is more than 50% double Bs. There's only 10% or so of triple Cs in the main US index. So this is a very different index to what it was you know, 10, 20 years ago. More importantly, our belief is that as we see um, credit become available, albeit at a higher price, it will force companies to make choices more around the projects and the investments that they make. And I think there's been an argument for some time, which has been that we've seen, you know, uh, a rising tide floating all boats because of very low interest rates. This actually forces more um, behaviour which actually focuses on the growth and the long-term um, you know, viability of businesses. Um, so it's not that credit isn't available. Okay. It just has a certain cost, and companies can and are adapting to that within their, uh, within their financial strategy. Yeah, about 450 to 600 basis points over uh, base rates uh, relative to where we were over a year ago. John, thank you very much. Uh, John Bilton, uh, my guest this morning on the markets. Coming up, outpacing momentum. EV makers are posting record sales on the demand side. The details to come. Are you long Tesla? This is Bloomberg. The conversations that matter, the insights that you need. This is The Pulse. I'm Manish Cranny in Dubai. Tesla and BYD have both set fresh sales records in the second quarter, widening their lead as the world's top-selling electric car makers. Elon Musk-led Tesla delivered 466,000 cars worldwide, outpacing the street's estimates. BYD posted the best-ever quarterly sales results uh, for its new energy vehicles. Half fully electric sales and the other were plug-in hybrids. Derided many years ago by Elon Musk, BYD snaps at the Tesla heels. Alex Webb from Quick Take joins me now. So this momentum is driving faster and faster. Who's ahead? Well, I mean, BYD is selling a lot more units. Tesla remains at the very, very uh, punchy market cap. 
that it has. BYD has a slightly different approach. Obviously, not all of its vehicles are electric, and it has a far bigger market share in its home market of China. There's a slightly different approach in China where there isn't just this hunger for endless range. They're a little bit savvier about saying, well, actually, the average range driven by a vehicle any given day is probably only 30, 40 miles tops. So they make uh, smaller uh, battery vehicles, which actually have done pretty well in, 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 in gaining share in their home market. Okay, uh, well, we'll keep an eye on those, see how they open a little bit later on today. Alex, we'll come back to the Apple uh, AI, the future. Take three weeks on a beach and spend a couple of thousand dollars. That's the alternative to 3,500 bucks for your alternative reality on your face. Alex Webb uh, on the Tesla story coming up. We return to the protests in France. Uh, They're up for the fifth straight night right here on Bloomberg. The global rally extends amid optimism. U.S. inflation is moderating, but PIMCO warns about the disconnect between valuations and worsening economic backdrop. Authority tested, President Emmanuel Macron pushes to restore order across France after almost a week of riots sparked by a police officer's fatal shooting of a teenager as the costs mount. Plus, putting the foot down, Tesla and China's BYD set quarterly sales records on surging demand for electric vehicles. Good morning. Welcome to The Pulse. I'm Manus Cranny in Dubai. In for Francine Lacroix. Well, protests in France have continued for a fifth straight night over the police killing of a teenager. 45,000 police were deployed uh, across France in an effort to contain the clashes that left hundreds of public buildings and shops damaged or ransacked. We're joined now by Bloomberg's Caroline Conan in Paris. Uh, Francine, uh, pa uh, Caroline, excuse me, Freudian slip there. In for Francine and speaking to Caroline, it's all very French. But on a serious note, I mean, these were the fifth night of serious protests and the reaction from Macron's government has been about deploying forces. Are we anywhere closer to some kind of mediation and a reduction in the violence? I think the main problem, Manus, is that even though uh, these riots may calm down over the next few days, there are still deep issues in the French society with uh, this population of uh, immigrant descent that is not integrated enough in the French society. And this is where the critics against Emmanuel uh, Macron are focusing on. Uh, basically, there's been no plan of action for those so-called cités, the suburbs of these big towns uh, in uh, France, where you have a young population often uh, undereducated, underemployed, and not totally integrated with uh, the rest of the society and that has a feeling also of resentment and uh, discrimination. So clearly this is something that the government will have to address. Uh, President Macron is meeting today with the heads of the National Assembly and the French Senate. Tomorrow he's going to also invite more than 200 mayors, local mayors of uh, those cities who have been, that have been targeted uh, by the rioters over the past few days that have suffered, for example, attacks on public buildings, on schools, on supermarkets, and uh, uh, clearly there is a feeling that uh, these deep issues also need to be addressed uh, because since uh, the uh, last riots in France in 2005, uh, where you had a similar incident with two uh, boys uh, dying after trying to escape from the police, uh, not much has been done uh, in order to uh, really integrate those neighborhoods, those young people uh, who feel like they are on the sidelines of the French society. Caroline, thank you very much. Caroline Conan in Paris. Let's continue the conversation with Fabrice Porcier, CEO of political consultancy at Rasmussen Global. Fabrice, thank you for being with us. It's interesting that we compare with 2005 uh, the state of the French society then, the last time we had a state of emergency. Does Macron need to declare a state of emergency or would that be to admit that he's lost control? Well, it seems that things have fairly de-escalated compared to a few nights ago. Uh, so I guess there's less 
uh, need for uh, declaring a state of emergency. But what is clear is that this is not, uh, I think, a protest or riot against Macron. Uh, this is more part of the French society, like your correspondent just said, that is actually rebelling against their vision of a public authority, of law and order. Uh, triggered by obviously this uh, shooting at close range by a police officer on on the teenager, uh, so it's important to put that into uh, the right context. Again, uh, it's a disenfranchised part of the French society that is rebelling uh, via violence against what they see as public authority, not necessarily uh, against Macron or his policies. But he has been in charge for, for quite a while, and suppose the question goes to the heart of what should he now do to bring the disenfranchised in, to make state, not just statements of inclusivity, but actions of inclusivity. What would you be advising him to do right now? You've been a member of En Marche, as it was called then, um, so you're very familiar with the, with the environment around Macron. What should they be advising him to do to deliver inclusivity? Quite frankly, I think of all the French presidents and, and heads of governments in France over the last, I would say, three, four decades, since we have these issues of les banlieues, uh, it's, it's, I think Macron has gone a long way, and much further than many of his predecessors, in actually allowing uh, this part of the French society to have opportunities to uh, you know, uh, be able to, to join the economy uh, through this kind of new form of, of uh, uh, gig economies like Uber and so on. So I think he's done much more than many to try to include a part of that French society mm -hmm. into the broader economy. But there is a question of cultural differences uh, and real backlash. Also, uh, uh, it's important to underline, the polarization is not just from les banlieues. It's also, if you look at the French police force and the statement by the French police union, it is really, really radical. They are talking about getting rid of the vermin, uh, getting rid of those, those, those kind of uh, uh, parts of the French society. So I think you are seeing a polarization of French society that, in my view, goes well beyond uh, Macron's mandate and is a structural problem in the French society. Many people are writing that this is a George Floyd moment uh, that we saw in 2020 in the United States of America. Is that the correct comparison or is it culturally inappropriate? Obviously, the United States and France have very different uh, social mix, political uh, fabric. Uh, so I will, I will, I will be careful about drawing comparisons here. But you do have indeed uh, a sort of, uh, again, like as mentioned, polarization between part of the French society that feels socially and economically disenfranchised, and another part the, I, I, here in this case is the police force that feels very strongly about its mission so much that I think it made some statement that I think the French police union was talking about being in resistance, uh, including potentially against the French government. So, so I think you do have a problem of polarization similar to what you're seeing in the United States. There is this social divide between, one could say, metropolitan liberal elite within large cities, uh, specifically the capital, which, which is obviously Paris and the rest of the country. Is, is this a huge divide which Macron can tackle in any way? Is that in part what these protests are about, this disenfranchisement of many of the younger parts of society? But they're not part of that metropolitan liberal elite. I mean, it's very similar to, to, to some of the things that we saw in the United Kingdom in 2016 and 2015 as we went up to the Brexit vote. Is that part of the issue here? I think it's important to be nuanced here. Uh, what we call les banlieues, so the suburbs where many of these French uh, uh, youth uh, uh, come from uh, and live, actually also where a lot of people working every day to sustain the French economy. Uh, where also a lot of the, those French third or fourth generation migrants are actually building businesses, uh, making, you know, real kind of uh, economic lives. So, so I think it's important not mm -hmm. to see les banlieues as just 
purely disenfranchised versus the city centers or the French uh, rurality is actually there are lots of people working in the banlieue, including from this <clears throat> use. So I think things have changed, but not enough to indeed carry and uh, those who feel left behind, both politically, economically, but also culturally. Fabrice, thank you very much. But Fabrice Pleasure. CEO of Political Consultancy, Rasmussen, uh, Global, my guest this morning. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen heads to Beijing this week, and that makes her the second member of President Biden's cabinet to visit the Chinese capital. Bloomberg's Jill Deceased joins me now. Jill, good to have you with me again this morning. So what do we know about the Treasury Secretary's visit? Right now, Manis, this uh, seems to be a visit that's all about uh, continuing to try to mend ties between the U.S. and China. Uh, this is, I'll note, uh, the second um, a visit by a high-profile U.S. official to China in recent weeks. We saw uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken uh, make his visit to China just a few weeks ago. Uh, that, of course, was a visit that was tied up and ultimately delayed for quite a while because earlier this year, when he was originally supposed to visit, uh, we had that alleged Chinese spy balloon incident, um, uh, this balloon flying over the United States. So, you know, safe to say tensions have been pretty high between the U.S. and China right now. And so ultimately what Janet Yellen is likely looking to do here is to try to smooth things over, um, you know, continue to open up these lines of communications. I'm sure from her perspective, the Treasury Department has made trying to get China a little bit more involved in uh, debt relief involving um, distressed developing nations. Uh, but, um, you know, on the other hand, it's, it's probably there's probably going to be that sort of uh, that issue with continuing simmering tensions between the U.S. and China that's going to factor into her visit. The, um, of course, we've seen over the last year or so um, increasing sanctions that the U.S. has implied on China. We've seen them, uh, the Washington try to cut Beijing off from critical technologies involving the U.S. and other Western nations. Um, Beijing is probably going to want to pressure on that a little bit. But at least from a uh, from a from a U.S. perspective, it's it's really just about how to keep open these lines of communication between the world's two largest economies. Yeah, and of course, as we head towards this election uh, in the United States of America, it's about having something to bring to the electorate, which is pro-growth uh, uh, and de-escalation rather than antagonism. Now, when it comes to policy response mechanism, we're all eyes down on the PBOC for the rest of the year and what they do. But inherent in that is going to be the appointment of a new chief at the PBOC. And we got a glimmer of that over the weekend. What do we know? Who is he? Why do we care? We did, yes, Manis. So ultimately what we saw this weekend is Pen Gong Sheng, who is a deputy uh, governor at the PBOC, has been appointed party secretary. We're actually thinking that this, um, this may put him in line to become the new PBOC governor, um, succeeding Yi Gong, who was appointed to another term just a few months ago, but ultimately is past the retirement age for officials at that level in China. And so he wasn't really ever expected to uh, stick around for very long. What we know about this new party secretary um, or party chief is that uh, he's, a, he's a technocrat, uh, he's been at the PBOC as a deputy governor in other roles for a while. He's worked at some state banks before. This is somebody who really sort of signals that idea of continuity rather than radical change at the PBOC, which is likely very important for China right now. Because remember, we're still dealing with um, some contentious issues over uh, the slowing economic recovery. Uh, the PBOC just cut a key policy rate not too long ago. There's been a lot of interest in whether or not uh, those continuing rate cuts are, are going to happen over the course of the rest of this year, what monetary easing looks like in China as they try to navigate uh, the slowing recovery and try to rebuild momentum. That's a big part of it. And then, of course, okay. also, um, there's all highs, I think, right now on the on the one. So we're ultimately going to have to see how he measures with the downward pressure there. Yeah, it's an interesting move. Let's see what intervention comes to bear on the crosses there on the yuan. Jill, thank you very much. Jill Decease, uh, joining me on the very latest for the PBOC. And of course, Yellen's trip to China. Coming up, Yevgeny Prigozhin's move to Belarus has Poland on high alert. We get the latest on Russia and the Wagner leader right here on Bloomberg. A week after the aborted mutiny by the Wagner Group, there is still little clarity about operations of the mercenaries and the whereabouts of the leader. Poland, meanwhile, says it will deploy forces to its border 
with Belarus, citing security concerns. For more, let's bring in Maria today. Maria, good to see you. So, first of all, what do we know about where the leader of the Wagner Group is at the moment? Is he in Belarus? What's he preparing to do? Good morning. Uh, well, Manis, uh, if you believe Alexander Lukashenko, and some will say that is a huge leap of faith, he is in Belarus and he should be in Minsk. But the reality is we have not seen any footage or any pictures of Prigozhin ever since he said he would move to Belarus as part of a deal. Again, a lot of the details of that deal continue to be very murky. And the last time we heard from Prigozhin was a voice note. Remember, it was 11 minutes long and he repeated, I never intended to topple the Russian government. This was not about toppling the Russian authorities. And separately, which to me is probably a more more pressing and also more important question is what happens with Wagner because remember Vladimir Putin gave them three choices they could either join the Russian army which by the way paid their salaries according to the Kremlin for a year or essentially go home or exile in Belarus at this point it's unclear how many members of Wagner have actually joined the Russian army and of course the war in Ukraine continues and the question will be if, if they are not part of the movement with the Russian army, just how weakened is that push forward? Now, look, Maria, the other side of this entire conversation is about Poland, perhaps the most contentious border of all. Um, they are said to be deploying more forces to the border. Uh, these are anti-terror units. What should I draw from that missive? Well, Manos, two things. Uh, yesterday, by the way, confirmation from the Polish uh, interior minister that they will indeed deploy, as you say, another 500 forces, including counterterrorism. They say a lot of this has to do with Prigozhin maybe or maybe not operating out of Belarus. And remember, they share a big land border, and we have seen tensions flare up between Belarus and Poland in the past. Remember, about two years ago, Poland accused Lukashenko of sending thousands of illegal immigrants to create tensions at the border. The other issue, and one of our viewers, again, I think our viewers are very smart, also spotted this, has to do with the politics. Poland will hold an election this year. We still don't know the exact date. But of course, for the Polish government, this is about presenting themselves as being tough on Russia, being tough on Belarus, and of course, also being tough on migration. Yep, some pretty strong messages to take to the election. Maria, thank you very much. Maria Tadeo in Brussels. Coming up in the show, from Adidas to Alphabet to Vinci, we take a look at the 10 companies that you need to watch for the third quarter, right here on Bloomberg. Conversations that matter, the insights that you need. It's right here on The Pulse. I'm Manus Cranny in Dubai. It's going to be a pretty spectacular week for bonds, even though it is the 4th of July and a lot of people are already left to the Hamptons. Yields rise ever so slightly. You have, of course, the former New York lead at the Fed talking about 4.5% being a reasonable level. This is, of course, Bill Duddy. 4.5% is a reasonable conservative estimate for where the bond market will go in yields. I had Standard Chartered in the seat beside me this morning saying 3.3% by the end of the year. You're going to get the jobs report at the end of the week. You're going to shudder around the hourly average earnings. And, of course, you're going to get the validation for the pause in the minutes on Wednesday night. So there's a lot to play for. So from uh, spectacular moves in the bond market, and by the way, PIMCO does prefer a hard landing. Maybe that will give you a reason to be long duration at this juncture, to Wimbledon. There are many things that one misses from the United Kingdom, and Wimbledon is one of them. Centre Court is where we kick off today, uh, and we're going to see uh, Kachin versus Djokovic play on the Centre Court. Got to say, it's the best day to go to Wimbledon. You see last year's winners on Central Court, and a jolly nice lunch I've had under court number one. Oh, those halcyon days in SW19. And we'll be looking at the strawberry index as we go along. So it's a big week for data, it's a big week for strawberries and tennis, but also corporate turnarounds. How do you bridge that gap? AI opportunities on Bloomberg. That's what we're going to talk about. Uh, 
we've got Bloomberg Intelligence. They have 10 that you need to focus on. You need to watch out for this third quarter. We brought in Tim Craighead. He joins me now with the very latest. So we can't find any strawberry companies in the top 10, <laughs> I'm sure. But talk to me about what, well, the consumer could be king in the third quarter. Fill or kill for the consumer. What are you going to fill your boots with in the third quarter, Tim? Good morning. Hey, how you doing, Manus? Uh, let me give you some context around this list of, of 10 ideas. Um, we have our focus ideas within Bloomberg Intelligence, and these are companies where we have a strong fundamental view that's differentiated from the market's belief. And importantly, we also see catalyst ahead that can bring the market around to our point of view. And, you know, those three pillars um, give us ideas that might span 6, 12, 18 months. The 10 on this list that you see um, all have catalysts coming up in the third quarter, which makes them particularly timely from the standpoint of, of developments, especially in a world where we've got all sorts of craziness that you've correctly outlined, um, uh, creating volatility. Yeah, and we are seeing sort of the... the, the a small movements, I'd say, in vol around the market from bond to equity market volatility. So tell me some of the big ideas that you've mentioned in terms of AI. I mean, we're all talking about it. We're trying to understand how you want to be long, vicariously or directly and the energy transition as we go to COP28. Yeah. So there, there are a few themes that uh, I think you can pull out of this list. One of them correctly, as you said, is uh, AI. Um, generative AI is seen as a risk to Google's search business. We, however, would argue it's a positive for its broader cloud business. And there's also positive dynamics happening with, um, with YouTube along the side. We think all of this should drive better than expected results coming up um, as they release numbers um, uh, later in July. So that would be one. Uh, another, you mentioned energy transition. Uh, Vinci uh, is one of the world's largest um, engineering and construction companies. And, you know, the, the spending that is going on uh, for this secular theme out of Europe, out of the U.S., play right into, um, you know, its main business. Uh, it also does, as I'm sure you're aware, um, own Gatwick uh, within its air uh, uh, airline uh, airport um, concessions. And certainly travel is picking up, and that's a good story there. So a couple of themes. I can absolutely verify the travel is picking up. Not one plane have I been on, and I've been on many in the past three weeks, was empty <laughs> in all classes of travel, I should add. Tim, we're going to leave it there. We look forward to the report. And the third quarter, uh, I've never met a wealthy pessimist, is what one fund manager said to me when he came in here recently. He met me. Uh, we'll leave you with that thought. B.I. Go uh, on your Bloomberg terminal. Quick snapshot of risk as we go into this 4th of July holiday. Do you want to be long with impunity into the second half of the year? $5 trillion was added to the NASDAQ index in the first half. You got away with immunity. Can you trade with impunity? We're blowing through the levels of the year-end estimates. Stocks are bid as we go to market this Monday morning.